First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Simon, for the invitation today. This is uh, the first time um, that we have, I publicly, publicly have talked to a larger audience uh, about this very exciting um, LTER program um, that focuses on the Beaufort Sea Lagoons in Alaska. And um, so I, I uh, appreciate very much this opportunity. And I'm, I, as far as what we're gonna do today or the next 20 minutes or so, um, this is, by the way, this is Ken Dunton, and, and I'm lead of the LTER, Beaufort Sea Lagoons LTER here at the University of Texas, and, uh, and Jim McClellan is the co-lead in this project, and together um, we will, uh, we're looking forward to implementing the program um, starting, actually we started the implementation now, but we won't be in the field of the next summer dealing with all the logistics, uh, getting all the logistics set up. Um, the, um, um, let's see, I'm waiting for this thing. Let me get this to advance. There we are. So um, as far as what we're going to do, um, I'm going to talk about the background um, on, the, uh, on, the, on this um, Lagoon LTER, which you have the acronym BLE for both Lagoon Ecosystems, um, and talk about some of the recent uh, work that led to um, the formulation of this proposal, which we're very excited about. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. I'll probably say that more than once, but and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the performance elements um, in, in our program that match the, um, uh, our, that match the coastal resilience um, theme. And that involves um, engaging coastal communities um, and monitor trends and model processes. So, and then I'll have a, a concluding slide on some parting thoughts. First, um, um, the, the, Big, the big 40,000 foot view in terms of the Beaufort Lagoon Ecosystems uh, uh, site, uh, uh, location of sites and stations and domains. So we have three domains um, in the western, central, and eastern Beaufort. Barrow, the central, uh, the western Beaufort, toward Prudhoe, and the central Beaufort, and eastern Beaufort, centered by Bader Island at the village of Katovic. There are two lagoon systems located with each domain. Um, that would be, um, and, and then there's two pairs of shallow and deep stations with each one of those lagoons. And each, and in each of these stations, we're doing, performing a full set of link core physical, chemical, bio biological measurements um, during the period of ice cover, which would be in April, during breakup in late May, June, and during the open water season. So at Barrow, we're, we're focused on Elson Lagoon. Uh, these, and since Elson is, is so big, we've divided it into an eastern and western portion. Over, in, over toward the central Beaufort, the, the uh, lagoons there is Stephenson Sound and Camden Bay. Some of you who've been around as long as I have <laughs> may recall that Camden Bay was the site was the site of an intensive ecological program conducted under OXIP funding back in the 60s, 70s and early 80s. Um, a lot of great work uh, came from that program and we're gonna take advantage of a lot of that uh, information. The other one is Stephenson Sound, which has also been occupied. Um, there's a kelp community out there and that's been occupied uh, as well for nearly 40 years. So a tremendously good database there. Um, toward Katovic and Eastern Beaufort, our lagoons are two fairly small sized lagoons, um, Katovic Lagoon and Jago Lagoon. And they're both very different. Um, um, a Katovic Lagoon doesn't receive any direct river inputs which, whereas Jago does, is the massive Jago River comes in, in that, into that lagoon. So they're very interesting. They, they provide a very interesting comparison for us. Um, and then uh, I think this, this cartoon pretty much provides an, a good illustration of the fact that we are working at the basically the um, interface between land and ocean. And that's what's very exciting about this program. There's a lot going on um, that we haven't really focused on um, in, in the near shore Beaufort, the near shore coastal areas and these, and these very productive lagoon systems. And, um, and I think one of the biggest uh, challenges and one of the most interesting um, uh, contrasts here is what goes on between seasons. Uh, on the left you know, is just, as we are the spring season um, with ice melt and, and then you have the open and all the interactions or some of the interactions are, uh, that are not occurring but do occur during the summer open water period, for instance, with the decrease in, in ice extent, lar large amount of fetch, big ocean waves, and you'll see Jim McClellan out there surfing those waves off those barrier <laughs> islands. Um, I, I don't know if any reviewers caught that in the proposal, but we, we put it in there on purpose. Um, Jim and I both surf, and we both are thinking of catching those waves one of these years. 
Um, so one of the questions, our major questions to though, this proposal are involved with the interaction between fresh water flows, coastal erosion, ice scour, and ocean mixing, and how they influence biogeochemical cycling and biotic community characteristics of that land sea interface over seasonal to multi-decadal timeframes. And I'll, I'm going to spend, I'm going to emphasize seasonal quite a bit here, as you'll see. And then, uh, and then do these temporal variations play a central role in determining trophic linkages, stability, and resilience of food webs? And that resilience theme um, is, a, is, is actually a pretty big part of, of, of our proposal. Um, and um, uh, there's, of course, you'll see there's a lot of components to this, but the resilience um, uh, theme um, is very, uh, very big part of it. Um, and then, um, uh, in terms of uh, the 40, another view uh, of this um, system, well, this, this, this schematic uh, cartoon gives you um, an idea of the, of the five major thematic components. Well, there's actually four major thematic, thematic components plus a, a modeling component. Um, so Mike Rollins and Yvette are handling the hydrological and ecosystem modeling uh, respectively. But uh, in terms of the major science efforts, we have a, we're looking at freshwater and nutrient comp contrib contributions, um, and you'll see the PIs listed there. Um, sea ice circulation, Barry Island dynamics, um, and uh, of course the, bio the bi biogeochemistry, which is basically sediment biogeochemistry, um, and of course food webs, ecosystem resilience, uh, and, and under the next topic under with microbial communities. So these are um, these are the major topics you'll see all the. Uh, in this schematic, um, all the toys um, uh, that we'll be, employ, we'll be employing to do this. Um, um, it turns out that Jim McClellan and I have successfully worked during the ice covered and breakup periods um, in these lagoons. Um, we, and we developed um, those um, mechanisms and those, those procedures uh, on, a, on a former NSF, previous NSF grant. And you'll see here, you know, there's everything from ROVs, um, to um, inflatable boats, and then in terms of, of um, um, deployments, we've got tilt current meters. We've got long. We've got. I'll talk about this in a second. Long-term sensors. We've got hydrospheres to look at CO2, dissolved CO2 in the water column, and of course we've got all of the remote sensing measurements that we're making to look at uh, um, uh, changes in um, um, erosion and uh, and looking and, and basically. Stood, um, characterizing rates and volumetric loss and gains. So that's, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, that's all of it. I don't want to spend too much time with this because I, we, we don't have that much time, but this gives you a, a pretty good idea of, of what we're up to. Um, and we'll be doing, of course, as I said, these measurements three times a year at, in three different domains all, along the coast. Um, the in-situ sensor deployment is, is very, very important. This will allow us to make long-term measurements um, uh, underneath the ice um, year round. Um, and we've done this before. We've been very successful, in fact. And um, so um, Jeremy um, and um, um, Casper and, and, and uh, Andy Mahoney, for instance, will be deploying pressure gauges and tilt meters and current meters and, um, and so forth, uh, seasonal ice mass balance buoys um, to look at the um, dynamics of exchange between the Beaufort Sea um, and these lagoons through these narrow passes in the Barry Islands. So this is, this is going to be very, very important because uh, the, um, the character of these lagoons is very much affected by changes in sea level, um, which means, which is translated into, ex into exchange, water exchange processes, and ultimately governs the salinity um, um, in, in these lagoon systems. Uh, I've already talked about throw some remote sensing um, and, uh, and again, the seasonal field component. So, um, one of the, for some background, and, and I'm not, I'm certainly not telling you anything you don't know, but we have um, uh, looked at some of these systems for a long time. I'm in my, uh, this is, for, this year is 40 years for me working in the Arctic. Um, and I started working with Stephenson Sound in 1977. Um, my grad student and I are putting together a paper um, on, on the system. And um, back in 1977, I had a field season, open water season, that's 17 days longer than it is now. So these are ice records from Stephenson Sound, and you can see that um, we've pretty much lost uh, ice uh, in the last uh, decade or so, or the last five years. It's just very rarely that you see very much ice during the mid during the open water period in, in late July, August. It's completely gone. Um, we're starting our field seasons now uh, about eight nine days earlier than I did. 
um, back in the in the uh, uh, in the seventies. So um, these um, uh, these changes have a profound impact on these lagoon systems. Even Catawba Lagoon, um, we're seeing ice out now before the first of July, and that's um, the, the the natives have keep me posted on that. And it's just amazing to have um, um, the ice disappear that early in the season. Of course, that means uh, erosion uh, is 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 rapid and extensive. Um, you can see here's a photograph I took off Fire Island in 2007. Uh, you can see the size of the waves, two, three meter waves coming in, knocking off um, pieces of tons of the size of house, small houses, enormous release of particular organic carbon in Nisha and Lagoon waters. We don't know really the fate of all this organic matter um, or its effect on uh, an, a significant effect that we know on light attenuation on primary production uh, in these natural systems. Some of the most interesting work um, was recently done by Rory Churchwell in uh, Jagel, in the Jagel Delta. And um, here um, you can, um, uh, what I have in front of you is um, Roy's uh, assessment of different invertebrate, freshwater invertebrate groups during the early season, mid season, late season during um, the summer. And early season is, is basically mid July or as, or as early as he can, as the ice, as you can get out there safely without, uh, with ice conditions and then through late season, which is late August. Um, and the groups on the left side, the oligochaetes are, are, are basically worms. Carinomids are, are um, fly larvae, and uh, Tepilidae are uh, crane flies, Diptera. Um, and, and what's interesting is that you'll see on the, on the first column, the, um, the yellow areas denote the highest levels of, of, of biomass or, or, or abundance. And, um, and that biomass abundance is greatest on toward the right side of these diagrams. And that's where the Jago River enters um, the Jago Lagoon. And um, what's amazing, however, is that there's a very high concentration of albuquites and chironomids and even these tapulids um, very early in July. Basically, these freshwater invertebrates survive freezing. Um, they can be fro they're frozen into the sediments all winter long um, and then pop out in the spring and alive and well. And that's and let's say something about resiliency. And this is uh, what Roy has shown here is that uh, during this period, so those freshwater invertebrates are very important um, food sources for hundreds of thousands of, of, of wading birds, 60 species of which complete their entire breeding cycle on the Beaufort Sea Coast and are important um, for uh, native subsistence. Um, and those, um, um, as you move through the summer, you'll see those yellow areas expanding, and that's due to the immigration of marine invertebrates like amphipod, very amphipod crustaceans, in particular um, polychaete, polychaete worms, marine worms, that are, all, that are important sources of, of um, food for these higher trophic level organisms. And in fact, uh, if you look at the stable isotopic ratios of these organisms, which is another um, piece of Roy's paper, you'll, know, you'll see that um, the, the, the higher trophic organisms are getting quite a range of carbon um, that uh, includes terrestrial organic carbon, which is highly depleted in C13 versus marine carbon, which is uh, less so. And so you mix up all those del C13 values, you end up with some pretty interesting results. And so a combination in terms of um, these deltas being looking like they don't have anything. And the truth of the matter is, is that the delta near shore waters of the lagoons are extremely um, populate, are well populated by um, freshwater and marine invertebrates um, that um, either survive the winter or immigrate in very, very quickly um, and, uh, and, and give a, a good um, reflection of, of the kind of resilient systems that we have in, in the Beaufort. Um, in, in, as a side to that, um, we've done, um, I've also noted the shift in um, the ice topic composition of some of the major um, invertebrate, invertebrate species in these lagoons. This is a graphic here showing that as you move, the yellow denotes organisms collected and, and, open, cir and open circles in April and June respectively. But, and then the arrow, and then as the season, as you move into August, you notice that all the arrows are going left as, as these organisms, uh, these, these uh, biota are extremely opportunistic in their feeding habits. They, they, their diet shifts from that of being predominantly dependent on marine carbon, whether it's benthic microalgae, or, um, or in the main case, benthic microalgae, um, to terrestrial sources of carbon during the summer. Um, that's just a function of the dilution of 
uh, on the end of the blooms, the winter blooms that occur under the ice um, during uh, the iced over period. So we've got some pretty interesting uh, 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 patterns going on here. Gammarus, by the way, was noted back in the 70s on the OXA program. Gammarus cetosis is known for its ability to, to consume peat, has a digestive flora in its gut to actually assimilate peat carbon. Um, and then moving on, um, so we've noticed uh, that there are uh, important, uh, besides the particular organic matter coming in from river, from terrestrial sources, um, we also have, a, as I pointed out in the last graph, a significant benthic microalgal component, which, um, which basically leads to a food web that is distributed um, uh, widely in terms of its del C13 value. So it's not in the upper right panel, you'll see one carbon source system with all the organisms moving uh, upward in a linear fashion in terms of their trophic um, uh, position. But in these lagoon systems, it is, uh, it is a very, opt they all have very opportunistic feeding habits um, and they're distributed more or less horizontally across the isotopic uh, del C13 scale. So very, um, it, it again um, depict, is, reflects the um, very um, uh, um, resilient nature of these, of these organisms, of these benthic biota in terms of being uh, very optimistic in their feeding habits. I, we put together a food web on this um, and um, that food web has, we've updated it now to include the microphotobenthos, the benthic microalgae uh, as, as important sources of carbon in, in, in these systems. And we also know this from looking at the degradation products of chlorophyll from the sediments. Um, we see that it is actually being grazed by metazoans and by, by bacteria. So uh, it, this is exciting. Uh, this is an area that we're going to spend more time with uh, in, in, uh, under this LTER. On the theme of resilience, um, um, uh, we, the, the disturbances are, are central to um, our our uh, Beaufort Lagoon ecosystem dynamic. Um, we see extreme fluctuations in salinity from hypersaline to fresh. Uh, and that is not only in the water column, that is on the seabed. And I'll show you examples of that here shortly. We see hypoxic levels of dissolved oxygen, especially during the late, um, the late months of the ice covered period. We have, we have organisms that are being uh, either frozen to, uh, or subject to ice scour. We've come sometimes some tremendous uh, sedimentation events, burial events. Um, so our approaches are, uh, that we're going to make are, are looking at the relationships between biotic, biotic communities and the, and the physical chemical variables that we measure over space and time. And, and we have some experimental manipulations planned. One is um, one that we've already successfully done in, in steps of sound and is reciprocal transplants of, of various in funnel, um, right funnel assemblages between shallow and deep water stations. Uh, I didn't mention our, our, our stations, our paired stations, these lagoons, there's one in deep water and the second station is in shallow water, less than two meters deep. Um, and we'll be sampling those uh, through the ice um, on this program. So some of the performance elements um, that um, I saw that was a, a very good match to what we've already proposed. Uh, one of them is, is engaging coastal communities in research and advancing knowledge on cultural, on cultural safety and infrastructure issues. Um, and they were broken down into uh, 811 and 812 and, and the first one was basically engaging locals in, in your research and the second was empowering those folks to lead their own monitoring studies as, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, Simon. So um, we have been doing this for quite a while. In fact, these pictures are taken during our, uh, our last uh, our, uh, NSF um, program we had a few years ago. Um, we involved high school students extensively on the ice collecting uh, um, if, showing them how to collect data, how to drill holes in the ice and, uh, and what have you, keeping field notebooks. And then once we, were, we had them um, doing that, we then moved on and, and hired them basically as citizen scientists. So after we left, they went out um, on their own with their snow machines, kept the holes open in the ice and could continue to collect data for us in these lagoon systems off Katovic uh, while we were gone. And, and they did a really good job. They, they had, um, uh, these are post on the right panel. There's a two high school postgraduates with Fenton Rexford. For, and Fenton Rexford is an elder that I asked to do out with the kids on the ice. And he is now um, the new um, uh, chairman or president of the Katovic Inupia Corporation. And, and for us, it's really important to have really, to really work with these guys. Um, and, and, and we've developed such great relationships with them. Um, and and uh, we have really enjoyed working and, and trained so many, so many of the kids in the community. So these are, these are um, already um, 
programs that we have that we are going have implemented and will implement in a in a in a very um, um, intensive way um, through the LTERBLE um, program. Um, the other one is uh, is, uh, is is basically advancing knowledge of ecosystems and environmental health and coastal areas by monitoring trends and modeling biological processes. And you'll see here in this graph, you can see those the the, the uh, um, the changes in salinity given in red during that breakup, during that breakup period, tremendous influx of fresh water, and for weeks on the seabed, because um, these sensors were deployed on the seabed, you have salinities of, of, of nearly zero parts per thousand. And how, how the benthic and fauna deals with that, I'm not sure, but they do deal with it because we do not see tremendous decreases in biomass, in fauna biomass or abundance in these systems. So we'll be spending some, again, looking, uh, and this is another good example of the, how resilient these, these systems are. Um, so um, the first, uh, uh, under that um, uh, uh, um, statement was addressing processes and biotic abiotic feedback loops and how they affect species distribution abundance and ecology of long lived benthic species. So we'll be through our um, uh, reciprocal experiments through measuring um, uh, massive measurements, or I should say, um, frequent and widespread measurements in these three lagoon systems of, of infaunal biomass density, stable and using stable carbon isotope ratios and nitrogen, look at food web dynamics. Um, we hope to get uh, uh, a really good um, um, idea on how these populations change over time with respect to events like this, which I've, which I've highlighted with these ellipses, these again, these fresh water inflow events um, that have distinct effects on community structure. And in fact, the diagram, the picture on the top right is the kelp bed community in Stephenson Sound. And we have seen, um, we have documented extremely interesting spatial patterns um, in um, species composition in response to uh, distance from the Sacramento Arctic River Delta. So um, I, 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 I'm very excited about um, delving into this further. Okay, and then the second one uh, under the uh, uh, second performance element was developing ecological modeling capabilities to understand issues related to the vulnerability of, of coastal species and ecosystems of climate change. And these set of, of models here um, that Bailey McMeans put together um, that are in our proposal um, illustrate um, that we we expect that we're taking advantage of this, ex, you know, question about the extreme seasonality of lagoons. and how they produce changes in species composition or community composition and tropics um, to sustain and how they, how we have managed to, how these systems manage to maintain uh, themselves to sustain these ecosystem functions um, that are indicative of resiliency despite, you know, very large disturbances that are brought on by seasonal uh, changes in ice, scour, salinity, oxygen, what have you. Um, and um, of course, um, diversity is a very important uh, component there, um, and we expect diversity to be different at the different sites during the different seasons. Um, our resilience, uh, which is which we measure basically as a as a um, as an interannual, basically we define it as a, as measured as the interannual reestablishment of function, um, measured as, as either respiration rate or biomass, um, and stability measured as perhaps diversity following a perturbation and. And so um, we've, we've put together just some models here of how we could look at this on seasonal scales, which is basically um, uh, letter B, um, and then long, in terms of long-term long -term climate variability and uh, on the panels on the letter C, um, whereas as climate variability increases, your resilience, resiliency or stability will most likely decrease along as reflected by diversity and decreases. So those are the kinds of uh, things we're up to. Um, I, and um, uh, other possibilities, other performance elements that I recognize that could um, be good, that could be synergistic for sure would be A3, which is advancing knowledge on the physical coastal processes that impact natural and built environments. And that would, of course, be related to this high, spe high spatial resolution side of imagery that um, Craig Tweedy is collecting to look at rates and volumetric loss gains. Um, and then um, we'll be doing a lot of mapping um, and uh, at these three domains. And so I, I think that in 8.4, which is improving observation, mapping and charting to support research across the coastal interface is another area of, of possible um, synergy. Um, finally, um, um, we had, Jim and I have had some time to 
beat this around a little bit and some of the questions that we came up with that we've been thinking about um, um, regarding re regarding resilience um, uh, is questions about you know these these systems that are that are constantly um, under uh, perturbed um, annually um, by it, it sees these these profound seasonal events, uh, fresh water and flow and ice, what have you. We wonder, is succession to a steady state ever achieved? You know, does the successional process differ depending on the perturbation? How might the timing of the perturbation re affect recovery and, and so on? Um, and, uh, and finally, how resistant or resilient are these community systems to disturbance regimes? So those are, um, those are some of the, the questions that, that we um, are particularly excited about um, with respect to um, this, this ecological component of, of the Buffett Lagoon Ecosystem LTER. So with that, um, I'll be happy to, uh, um, I don't know if there's any time for questions because you have a pretty busy schedule, Simon, but um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this. Sure, um, just so you know that uh, uh, at least one question has come in uh, from Becky Heim at the National Weather Service. Alaska region uh, pointing to some products that, that they have. I don't know if Becky, do you want to say anything uh, more? But if you do, please be brief because uh, you know we uh, we do want to let Alex have his uh, his time. Okay, I, I, I don't hear anything if you're on mute. So Ken, maybe you could look at uh, at that comment. Uh, and okay. We try to capture it, um, and I think this is that was a sort of question that I uh, that w when you and I were talking about the talk before, uh, uh, you 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 commented also on other agencies that you felt needed to be at the table, uh, building from your project and your project building from them. Uh, do you want to say anything about that now, just in a few words? Yeah, I'll just a few words. I, I think that the interagency uh, uh, collaboration I, I, is extremely important. I've been um, lucky to have continued a lot of the work through a very good relationship with BOEM and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, at uh, Katovic. They have been instrumental in the work in Eastern Beaufort, just simply instrumental in, in, in logistical, providing logistical support. Um, and of course, my colleague Jim Spence works a lot with USGS um, as well. And, um, and we couldn't, we basically depend very heavily. Some of the data presented came from NOAA, uh, I mean, NOAA uh, um, um, data uh, sets and, and, uh, uh, and, and sites. So I, I think the, the um, um, relationship or the importance of involving um, a number of different agencies has always been important um, to our program. To, to the fact that I've been up there for 40 years, it's, it's all related to building synergies and, and partnerships with, with a variety of agencies. Okay, thanks, Ken.